Good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Nick, and joining me this morning is expert beekeeper Don Lamb. How are we doing this morning, Don? Great, Nick. Good to have you here. Well, thanks for having me. So, Don, how long have you been a beekeeper? We've been beekeeping for about 20 years now. So after 20 years, it's safe to assume that you probably know what you're doing. We have a good idea. We can work with them. Okay. So we're just going to go go back there. Well, I think it might be good if we first of all put some protective clothing on as we work with the bees. That would be great, Don. Follow me. Lead the way. Don, most people are deathly afraid of bees, yet you love them and find them so intriguing. What is it about bees that you find so amazing? It's uh, an intriguing society in there, in that the whole beehive is a hive that um, a group of bees that works together. And they're, each, each of the bees have, has a job. There are guard bees, there are nurse bees, there are housekeeper bees, <laughs> there are tacking bees, <laughs> there are oh. guard bees, and the whole works. And if they didn't work together, the beehive would fail, it would die, it wouldn't function, it could not continue if they didn't have this kind of cooperation. So I also can't help but notice that we're standing right here and there's bees right there. Is there any reason why I should be nervous or anxious without any gloves on or a veil on right now? Not at this point because we've not disturbed them. Uh, they are aware that we're here. But once we get inside the hive, it'll be a different story. So but we're going to disturb them. We are, we're going to take this top <laughs> off. But at this point, they're, they're docile, they're, they're going about their business, and there's no outside threat to them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, many thanks to uh, Paul Van Dyke and Nick Walters for putting their lives, their safety, and their comfort on the line to capture that footage. They did, they did a great job. I don't know about you, I'm not a big fan of bees. Like, I'm not terrified of bees, but I don't enjoy being around them. Uh, when Kelly and I lived in the Detroit area, we had a cider mill, a historic cider mill that was on this very picturesque winding creek. And every fall, we made a pilgrimage to get their, like, melt-in-your-mouth cinnamon sugar donuts and chilled apple cider. And the only thing that could ruin a perfect day at the mill was a swarm of bees because they're hovering around the garbage cans. They're crawling around the rim of your cup. They're landing on your shoulder. I'm like, this is not fun anymore. I, I'm going to forfeit the whole thing because I just, I don't, I would prefer not to get stung. And many of us, uh, we tend to perceive bees as threats. Uh, they're something that we maybe had a negative experience getting stung in the past. We're like, I would prefer not to do that again. The truth, however, is that bees are God's idea. They're a vital part of our ecosystem. Bees are responsible for pollinating crops and flowers. They give us both food and beauty. They give us honey, which is what people ate for dessert before we invented ice cream. The community behind the honeycomb, the beehive, is fascinating. Bees exhibit what scientists and neurobiologists call swarm intelligence. Dr. Seeley, a professor of neurobiology at Cornell, says swarm intelligence can be defined as the concept that describes how groups of animals capture prey, defend themselves, or make decisions in unison. It's as, it's as if they are operating with a single brain or a hive mind. In his book, Honeybee Democracy, Seeley says, the three pounds of bees in a swarm, just like the three pounds of neurons in a human brain, achieve their collective wisdom by organizing themselves in such a way that even though each individual has limited information and limited intelligence, the group as a whole makes a first-rate collective. A colony of bees, then, is far more than the aggregation of individuals. It is a composite being that functions as an integrated unit. 
Indeed, one can accurately think of a honeybee colony as a single living entity, weighing as much as 10 pounds and performing all of the basic physiological processes that support life including ingesting and digesting food, circulating resources, controlling body temperature, sensing the environment, deciding how to behave, and achieving locomotion. So we ask ourselves this question, how then does a hive thrive? And a hive thrives when it has the absence of disease, when it has protection from predators, when it has optimal temperature, and when it functions with that maximum cooperation when 20 to 30,000 different bees are functioning, operating as one. Well, then the next fair question is, what does this whole idea of a hive mind have to do with spiritual growth? One of the early followers of Jesus, Paul of Tarsus, wrote a letter to a group of people in Corinth, an ancient city in south-central Greece. In this letter, he includes this cryptic line, but we have the mind of Christ. The goal of the series that we're kicking off next week, our C6 series, is to explore this concept. What is the mind of Christ? How do we know the mind of Christ? What happens if we are all to think and act with the mind of Christ together? Organizational development consultant Stuart Cohen says, what people think and feel determines what they say and do. What people think and feel determines what they say and do. If we can change our thinking, we can change our living. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says this, We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. No, we declare God's wisdom. And that wisdom is a mystery that's been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it. If they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, What no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. These are the things God has revealed to us by his spirit. So my son, who is nine years old and is in fourth grade, is playing football, and he's got a new position this year. He's a halfback, and he wanted me to capture some of the plays that he was executing in a particular scrimmage. So he said, Dad, here's what's going to happen. If I find out in the huddle that the ball is coming to me, I'm going to give you a thumbs up behind my back because you're watching from the sideline. And that's when you know to take out your camera, to take out your phone and film me because it's going to be awesome. So I want to share all of my highlights and all of my athletic mastery to mom when I get home. And I go, okay. So if you didn't know that Joe was giving, like kind of leaking signs to the sideline, you wouldn't, you wouldn't have any idea how to anticipate the play was developing from the sideline. And the Apostle Paul is saying, that's how God operates. God is, God is tipping signs to us. God is giving us clues and insights into how the world operates and how the Spirit of God is at work that people who don't know and haven't received the mind of God cannot fully appreciate. This is what God does by the Spirit. He reveals to us truth we would not otherwise know. It continues in verse 10. The Spirit searches all things. Even the deep things of God. For who knows a person's thoughts except their own spirit within them? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the spirit of God. What we have received is not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, so that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak. Not in words taught us by human wisdom, but in the words taught us by the spirit, explaining spiritual realities with spirit-taught words. If you're a follower of Jesus, have you ever tried to engage somebody who is not yet a follower of Jesus in conversations about spiritual things? And have you noted that sometimes this results in frustration for both parties? The Apostle Paul is reminding us that we cannot understand the things of the Spirit until we have received the Spirit and choose to walk in the Spirit. Verse 14 says, the person without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God. They consider those things foolishness and cannot understand them because they are discerned only through the Spirit. The person with the Spirit makes judgment about all things, but such a person is not subject to merely human judgments. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. When Paul says, who has known the mind of the Lord, he's actually quoting the Old Testament prophet Isaiah, 
who in chapter 40 says, Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, or with the breadth of his hand marked off the heavens? Who has held the dust of the earth in a basket, or weighed the mountains on the scales and the hills in a balance? Who can fathom the spirit of the Lord or instruct the Lord as his counselor? The prophet Isaiah, who's writing some seven centuries before Paul, is asking a rhetorical question. When he says, who can know the mind of the Lord? The answer, of course, is no one. But Paul is answering this question in light of new information. Paul knows that Jesus Christ is both fully God and fully man and that his Ministry, his life, his death and resurrection have changed the arc of human history. And because Jesus has altered people's understanding and ability to interact with God, we have access to understand the mind of God in ways that Isaiah's generation could not. Paul says, who can know the mind of God? Well, because of the person of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit, the good news is we can. And he utters that phrase, we have the mind of Christ. So just want, let's walk through it together, put a little bit of emphasis on each progressive word. We have the mind of Christ. We hold a Christ-centered wisdom together. The mind of Christ is not some weird group consciousness. It is collectively discerned by the people of God. No, we won't all have the same human opinions, but we can desire what we can determine what God desires for us as a community together. And I think that when there has been spiritual abuse throughout history, whether that's been in churches, denominations, or cults, usually it has happened because some person has put themselves above the community at large and said, the only person who has the secret Dakota ring is me. And if you don't listen to me, you can't hear the voice of God. Paul democratizes spiritual understanding. He goes, he doesn't, Paul doesn't power up on the people of Corinth. He doesn't say, I and only I have the mind of Christ. And if you don't listen to me, you won't figure it out. He goes, no, we together have the ability to hear what God is saying to us as a group. I had a fascinating example of this yesterday. So I'm an assistant coach for my son's football team. They had their very first scrimmage yesterday. Uh, it ended badly. I don't really want to talk about it. However, in one particular team, my son caught the ball, and as he was being tackled by an opposing player, that player grabbed his face mask as he pulled him to the ground, at which point I said, in this very tone, face mask, face mask, that's a face mask. <laughs> no, that's not true. I, I said it differently than that. There may or may not have been a vein busting out right about here when I said, oh, for the love of God, that was a face mask! And um, the parents agreed with me, other fans agreed with me, the chain gang agreed with me. Unfortunately, the head umpire did not agree with me. Why? Because he had limited perspective. He was standing over here, the play was unfolding over here, and my son was being tackled as he faced the sideline out of the view of the ref. Wouldn't every game be better if everybody could vote on the calls? That, that if the entire stadium that had the, the collected information that the, that the booth in New York had, everything would end better that way. Because everybody could discern the one undeniable truth that that kid was wrong. See, God says, we have the mind of Christ. And I think a lot of times we get into trouble because we either say, hey, I can't know the mind of Christ, or if I know the mind of Christ, I'm going to figure it out by myself. I'm not going to walk with other people. I'm not going to give other people access to the inner workings of my heart and my spirit. I want to just walk with Jesus by myself. Paul does not give us that option. Because if you want to know the mind of Christ, you don't get to know it alone. We have to discern it together. We have the mind of Christ. Here's what else he says. He goes, we have the mind of Christ. As believers, we currently possess the mind of Christ. Paul comes out swinging with great swagger and confidence. He goes, we don't wish for it, hope for it, try for it. It is already ours. We can access it, exercise it, leverage it. We have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is not divided, it is not double-minded, it is not confused, it is both singular and clear. The hive mind of Jesus does not flip-flop, revert, or waver. God knows what God wants. We have the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is both coherent and rational. Make no mistakes, the feelings and the experiences that God gives to all of us are gifts, but they are not the primary filters for truth. 
God starts with the mind of Christ and confirms it through additional data points in our existence. Finally, we have the mind of Christ. In order to think like Jesus, we must know the person of Jesus. And fortunately, the word of God gives us a vivid and compelling description of this person, Jesus. We learn about him by watching his ministry. We watch his healings that teach us about his compassion, his exorcisms which teach us about his power, his provision which teach us about his care. We learn about his ethics in the Sermon on the Mount. We learn about his vision for the kingdom in his parables. We learn about his values and how he carries himself as both a gracious servant, a bold prophet, and a humble king. We learn about him from his sacrifice, his brutal torture, his body on the cross, and ultimately his empty tomb. The more we know about Jesus, and the more we know Jesus, and the more we readily walk with Jesus, the more we can discern the mind of Jesus. So how does it work? Again, Stuart Cohen said, what people think and feel determines what they say and do. Nate was so, so gracious and so courageous in sharing a little bit of his backstory about how as an adolescent man, he was struggling with feelings of depression and despair and self-harm. And this week marks Suicide Prevention Week nationwide. And many of us have had experiences in our own lives where we've struggled with darkness or despair, or temptations towards self-harm. Or we've seen it happen in the lives of people that we love. Or we've had to deal with the aftermath of people who have made life-altering or even tragically life-ending decisions. And the truth is, when we get in dark spaces, oftentimes it's for whatever reason we end up believing things about ourselves, about God, about the value of our own lives that are not ultimately true. And I believe that the mind of Christ matters because it can help some of us navigate life and death decisions. And it can help all of us know who God truly is, who God says we truly are. Because the way that we think about ourselves, the way that we view our own identity, has a significant influence on the choices that we make, how we conduct ourselves and our relationships. Our private thought lives feed into our public decisions and our actions. But let's look at a couple different statements and talk about how what we think could end up changing how we end up living. If we say, I am not in control of my circumstances, and we assume that I am all alone in this world without a lever to change it, then the result is that I am filled with anxiety. But if we say, I'm not in control of my own circumstances, however, God is committed to my well-being, then I can be filled with peace. See, I can choose the thought that determines what fills me. Let's try this one. You can say, I, I believe that tragic events happen all around me. And as a result, I am filled with despair. Because there's no meaning in any of it. Or I could say, tragic events happen all around me. But I believe that the word of God teaches me that God redeems all things. And as a result, I am filled with hope because just because I don't know how God is going to redeem this doesn't mean he won't. Or some of us have lived in this thought this week. People have hurt me and I have had no recourse for justice. And as a result, I am filled with resentment. I am haunted by feelings of both hostility and rage. Or we can say, people have hurt me and I have no recourse. That said, I understand that I have hurt others and I have offended God. Even so, God shows me mercy daily. Some of us remember that old line that his mercies are new every morning. And if I know that to be true, then I am filled with mercy. 
because God has been filled with mercy towards me. Small tweaks in what we choose to believe alone and together changes the lens through which we view reality and the manner in which we carry ourselves. So the question we want to ask together in this series is this, are we intentionally nurturing the mind of Christ? Because if we do, we will be the hive that thrives here at Central Wesleyan. Are we exercising the mind of Christ? Are we pursuing the mind of Christ? Are we discerning the mind of Christ in every situation together? This whole idea has been our lead pastor, Craig Reese's brainchild, and the staff and associated friends from the Water's Edge Network have put together a powerful six-week curriculum called the Hive Mind C6 Journey. And our hope is that hundreds of you will participate in small groups that will go through the Hive Mind material together. We call them C6 groups because the C stands for community and groups of 10 to 14 people will gather once a week for six weeks. See what we did there? And you'll meet for about 90 minutes. We would have called it C690, but that got a little cumbersome. And the goal is that in the course of an hour and a half, you would eat, discuss the content, encourage one another, and pray for each other. And I want to invite you to sign up for a group today. And I want to acknowledge this. Fall is a hectic season for all of us. Especially if you're a family with young kids, you, it can be very difficult to find any margin at all. I know in our house, Mondays is football, soccer, Tuesdays is gymnastics, Wednesdays is more soccer, Thursdays is football, Friday you try to catch a breath, Thursday is games, Sunday is church. Like, they're just, we're, we're going we're gonna to squeeze it in. And it hasn't been uh, easy or ideal for us to find a window, but Kelly and I are, might not go to all, every single C6 session together, but we were trying to have a representative from our family present. Why? Because we believe that God wants to meet us in a, an experience where we walk with other people. So if you have capacity to lead a group, we want you to sign up for that today. Because we want to be the kind of church that knows the mind of Christ together. Now that said, we believe that God's going to use this experience in very real and tangible ways to allow people to experience transformation at a, at a core level. So for those of you who are, uh, have already signed on to be six C6 leaders, I'd love for you to just go ahead and stand up, make your way down the aisle and join us right here in front of the stage. And we want to pray for you. Also, those of you who are part of our guest services team want to invite you to come down so that we can pray for you as well. Some of you don't know that we're, we're kind of rebooting our lobby experience next week. And there's going to be a little reception area called Central Connect where people for the ver who are attending here for the very first time can be welcomed, they can receive a gift, we can get some contact information for them and start them on their spiritual journey. Some people that we meet for the first time don't just want information, they're, they're trying to navigate a crisis. And they need somebody to hear their heart and pray for them in that moment. And that's why we've mobilized a team of what we call community shepherds to provide care in our connections room, our care room, immediately following the services. So if you're part of our community shepherds team, I'd love for you to come forward as well. Because our belief is that these group hosts, these guest services welcomers, and these community care prayers, intercessors, are all really critical points on a journey that creates space for people who are feeling isolated, disconnected, and alone to find a home, to find a sense of family, to find a very real sense of community. So if you know anybody who's gathered up here and you want to help us in praying for them, please, uh, by all means, join us. You can put a hand on a shoulder uh, as we pray for them. But let's be asking God uh, to use us, those of us who are representing Central at Large and those of you who are standing here specifically, um, that God would make himself real to you on this journey, that God would give you wisdom, energy, and the rich anointing of your, his Holy Spirit as you move forward. Let's pray together. Father God, I thank you for friends, both new and old, who are signing on for a run this fall to create space for people to find you. And some of those people are creating space in their calendar. They're creating literal space in their homes. Some of them are creating spiritual and emotional space in our lobby or in our prayer room for people to hear maybe for the first time that you see them, that you know them, that you love them, and that you are leading them into a new level of intimacy and closeness with you. So God, I just pray for grace for every person who's here. 
on those days where they're getting ready for their group and there's a thousand other things that are going on, I pray that you would give them peace. When somebody asks a tough question in a group or when somebody brings a difficult challenge to the prayer room, God, I pray that you would allow them to discern your mind and pray in accordance with your heart in that moment. And I pray that you would bind any spirit of fear, insecurity, self-doubt, or competition in their mind and that you would remove it now in the name of Jesus. And in its place, you would release a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. God, we thank you in advance for the dozens of people who are going to start a first-time relationship with Jesus Christ as a result of the conversations that are represented by this group of people. God, we thank you for the breakthroughs that are going to happen in understanding and healing and deliverance and reconciliation as a result of these C6 groups. We thank you, God, for the amazing stories that we're going to be able to come back and tell when this run is over about how you moved beyond our wildest imaginations. Because your mind for what you want to see happen in, through, and around this church is more imaginative, more creative, more intense than ours is yet. And God, our prayer is that you would bring our thinking and our expectations and our hopes into alignment with yours. So we thank you in advance for what you're going to do in us, through us, and completely in spite of us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.